Well, I love, I love uh, the passages that were read to start this ser- service this morning, and uh, one of my absolute favorites, I've got a short list of my top five Old Testament favorites, but the list is like 25 long, so I've I got to stop calling it my top five. But, but the, that one from Jeremiah 9, oh, oh my gosh. And actually, it's a great segue into what we're going to look at in Galatians this morning, but the, this is one of the few places, see, and I, we don't coordinate this. Dorothy just picks verses and says... Well, I- you read the passage, and then you pick some verses, and I, I just going, oh, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is uh, awesome. This is in the, it's in the end of Jeremiah 9. If you ever lose track, it's just at the end of the chapter in Jeremiah 9. But uh, he uses the word boast five times. And you don't hardly find that word anywhere else in the entire Bible, but in five, place, five places in that one verse. He says, thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. It's a good idea. Let not a mighty man boast of his might. Good idea. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. Good idea. So if you don't have wisdom, might, or riches, what can you boast of? Ah, well, he says right there. But let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me. That he understands and knows me. And what about him is that you know? That I am the Lord who exercises three really great things. Loving kindness, okay, justice, Okay, that's in defense of the people he loves. And righteousness on the earth, here amongst us. And then he says something that's really striking, for I delight in these things. And we've been, we've been talking about the law in Galatians. Remember I said a couple weeks ago, God's intention for your relationship with the law is that you love it? What he just mentioned right there is the law on earth. It's a reflection of who he is, and he delights in it. His loving kindness, his justice, and his righteousness. That's a great definition of who God is on earth. That's the law. And we'll talk more about that later. But we stopped short. Huh, huh, huh. Because as it goes on in the next couple of verses, what Paul's been talking about for the last couple of weeks is the fact that the law isn't just for Jews, and if they obey it, it makes them good, and the Gentiles have been you know, disregarding the law, so they're bad. That's not the case at all. It turns out you can have the law as a Jew and still mess up. Because he says, as he goes on after this, Behold, the days are coming. This is just the next verse. The days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will punish all who are circumcised, that's you know Jews, and yet who are uncircumcised. That means you know, they have the mark, but they really aren't God's people. And then he goes on and he says, Egypt and Judah and Edom and the sons of Ammon and Moab, this is mostly all very Gentiles, and all those inhabiting the desert who clip their hair on the temples, for all the nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in heart. So anyway... Yeah, I know. Go back and read the end of Jeremiah 9. It's awesome. So Paul has brought us to this point as he's looking at Galatians, as he's addressing this error of the fact that some people are going to go back and start doing the law like somehow that gains them something. And he says, no, that does not gain you anything, and specifically circumcision. So, so you can actually, Jeremiah says, you can be circumcised, that is, have the mark of God on you, but your heart is not God's. And that's what he'll judge. You can be physically baptized, but your life has not been placed into, that's what baptized means, placed into Christ, and that baptism won't do anything for you. You can, you can participate in the Lord's Supper every time that we do it, and you can, you can you know, eat that food, you know, drink the cup, but if you're not inside feeding on the Word in Christ himself, all that activity doesn't do you any good. So there's really, you see what I'm saying? There's a God inspects the heart, and these things reflect the heart. So... Uh, that was a freebie. I wasn't going to talk about that, but that's just such an awesome passage. Okay, so where do we get to in Galatians today? We've gotten to what I call uh, the yellow brick road section. <clears throat> Last week was the Colombo section. Um, don't write that in the margin of your Bible. Come on, it's, it's just the way I see it. So here, here's where we're at. It's the yellow brick road section. And for many Christians, you start, you start your walk with Christ on this yellow brick road, in a sense. I mean, you know the, what the path is. You know the direction you need to go. And you start this lifelong journey continuing to, be, to grow closer to Christ and understand who God is. So you can actually join in with, Matt, with, with uh, Jeremiah 9 and say, I can boast that I know who this God is. And that's that long journey that you have. But somewhere along the line in this journey, Satan brings you little forks in the road. And Paul is trying to warn us about one of these dangerous forks in the road. So when Dorothy got on this road, and where's the Oz, Dorothy? I'm sorry. <laughs> 
and Toto too. So, so when she gets on the story, she starts going to what looks like is going to solve her problems from, from being away from Kansas, and she's going to be there. But as she picks up friends along the road, they get to this fork in the road in a way, but they see this sign that comes up. Remember this scene? And that sign, if you look closely, it says this, you know, Haunted Forest, Witch's Castle, One Mile. And it says, I'd turn back if I were you. And that's what Paul's saying today. If you're on a different path, you better turn back. Now, if you're saying, oh, come on, this is just one of those dramatic intros to the passage. No, he actually posts a sign right here in Galatians that's just like this. Okay, let me see, let's see if you see it right here. He, we're starting in chapter 3, verse 10. And he says, he says, for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it's written. And I'm going to stop right there. I'll, we'll get the written part in a second. But just look at that phrase at the beginning there. He says, for as many, which is a way of saying everybody, which, is, which implies uh, Jews and Gentiles. So either Jews or Gentiles. If you're given over to this idea that if I obey the law and do everything in it, thing will be fine. That's what it's all about. Anybody, and that can be Jew or Gentile. He's been very clear about that so far. So as many, that is everyone, as are of, that, that's a way of him saying who puts their trust in. Um, you know, they're coming out of That's what they're pursuing. That's where they're going. Who puts their trust in the works of the law. And we looked last week and the week before that that's really legalism. The works of the law is Paul's phrase for saying people who put their trust in themselves to achieve the law. And in achieving the law, God looks at you and weighs you and says, wonderful, you did a great job, well done. No, that's not it. And that's actually, it's a difference. You don't put your trust in God. You put your trust in yourself to achieve and impress God. That's legalism. The works themselves might look absolutely identical from a failed perspective and a righteous perspective. Their works can be exactly the same. It's the intention of the heart. If you're doing it to earn, then you're wrong. Okay, so that's what he's saying. That's legalism. So everyone, uh, as many as are of the works of the law, that's legalism, are under a curse. You're doomed. <laughs> that means you're, it's not going to get you anywhere. It's, just, it's a curse. In the end, no matter how hard you work at it, no matter how many things you achieve in the law, you're doomed. So this is, if I rearrange the sentence, it says exactly this, this is the sign in the woods. Everyone who puts their trust in legalism is doomed. Did you get it? It's really, it's just that the phrasing, they, you know, the translators in English tried to make this very literal Greek English, but that's, that's really all it says right there. If you dedicate yourself on your walk toward God and somehow you missed it and decided, I think I'm going to impress God by achieving on my own power, looking good and being loving kindness and justice and righteousness, as in Jeremiah 9, if you can do all those things and achieve all those things, God will be impressed with me. <sighs> right? That's legalism. And of course, we look at that and say, I would never do that. But, but we do. Anytime, anytime you look at an action you do or don't do and say, gee, I, I, don't, I need to do this because God's really expecting this of me. I really ought, when you hear ought, I really ought to do this. Or I didn't do it. Oh, I feel really bad. I didn't do it. Oh. God thinks lesser of me, you know. Well, no, that's, and we'll get more on that later on. Because the works themselves are okay. It's the heart attitude that's different. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that very famous passage. But then he goes on to 10 after that, and he says, well, we're created for good works. So they're supposed to be coming out of us. The difference is whether you're using them to earn or you're doing them in response of love to him. And we'll, we'll, we'll split hairs on that more as we go on. So... But this is what he's saying. Everyone who puts their trust in legalism is doomed. I'd turn back if I were you. That's all he's saying right here. This, this is how he's capping off this thing, uh, this first section about how serious this really is. Don't go down this road, is what he's saying. And then he quotes for us from the Old Testament. And this is his sign in the woods. He says, because look, it says, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. And he's smushed together several verses from Deuteronomy and in another place as well. I put the two dominant ones here. But that's what he's saying. Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. So your response is, I'll just double down and work harder. Well, that could, that could be one of the typical responses. You could say, I've been lazy. I, if I'm really going to live by the law, I really need to get serious and do this and just really buckle down and get better at it. But I'm going to make a case in the next five minutes that that's a bad response. Okay? 
Let's look at this a little more closely. Cursed is everyone, that's the doomed part, who does not abide by. And the word abide, it means to live. It means to live. It was always in contrast with them. You know, they had nomadic peoples that would wander all around, usually Arabia, even to this day, people nomadically. And you ask them, where do they live? Well, wherever they want to tomorrow. I mean, they're just like all over the place. And that idea came to the metaphor of, of someone living in tents and unpredictably living wherever is advantageous. That, that metaphor came to mean someone who's sort of blown around by different theological and spiritual things all the time. They, they plant their tent wherever they want to plant their tent, today or tomorrow, there's nothing that holds them down. So Jesus says, that's not good. What you need to do is abide. And the word abide means to be where you're camping and say, I'm going to stay right here. That's to abide. It's consciously to say, I'm going to stop flitting all over the place. I'm going to abide. So abide is a conscious decision to put your roots down here and to live life here. So when he uses that here, what he's saying is is if you're going to do this, you have to actually plant your entire life in the law. Everything about the law and everything about life is merged together. So when you wake up in the morning, you think about the law. When you have lunch, you think about the law. When you have dinner and you go to bed, you think about the law. And all day long, all you think about is the law, and you abide in it because actually the house of life for you needs to be the law. So you better be totally immersed. You, you just better be in it, which is a criticism against people who dabble in the law, who visit it every now and then, right? He's saying, no, if you're going to do this, you have to be consumed with the law. You got to live in it. You got to put your stakes down and say, I'm not going anywhere else. I'm here. Well, then I think I can do that. So he captures all these ideas right here. He says it's, it's where you live all the time. You live, breathe, and sleep. That's our modern version of saying you live, breathe, and sleep the law. You attend to it. Everything you do is with measure to that. Now, I can't think of a better description of a Pharisee during the first century. Because a Pharisee would say, everything I do must be measured by what the law says is right and wrong. Everything. And so they would, they would literally, that, that was their life mission, was to live out the law so perfectly that they would demonstrate for the people who don't know how to read Hebrew what it means to live by the law. And you need to be like me, is what they'd say. I'm, a, I'm an example of living righteously and, and justly, and, and I incorporate everything, and I've fine-tuned what the law means, so I'm only going to take 15 steps today instead of 100 steps today. And that, this is what the law means. And so they would live this out. It's a Pharisee. Everything they did, they measured against, is this good or is this bad, according to the law? They abided in it. They lived in it. It was their, they lived, breathed, ate, sleep 24-7, 365 a year. So the writer back here is saying it back in Deuteronomy, if you really want to do this, you got to go all the way in. you got to go all the way in. And the Pharisees were all the way in. Of course, Jesus gives them a surprise later on about this. So you got to not only abide in it, but you have to do all things. All, like all things. Like, all things. This is not 80%. <laughs> and when I was in school, 80% was a pretty darn good grade for me. Let me tell you, buddy. That's okay, you know. Are you a good student? I get 80%. Oh, yeah, you're a good student. Very good. But actually, it's more than 80%. Uh, let's see where our threshold is. Does this mean like 85? Uh, no, it's, it's higher than that. Maybe 90%. 90%? 90%? I, I love 90% in school. That was just right into an A. <laughs> I know. I, this is like your definition of a good person in percentages. Is, you know, I'll go for 90. You can even go for like 95% or the very, very famous 99%. <laughs> or the very famous 99 and 44 one hundredths. <laughs> Which comes from ivory soap, by the way. If, in case you didn't know, you know, Procter & Gamble made an entire empire on ivory soap back in the 1870s. And uh, uh, just a little trivia, uh, they, they would advertise it as 99 and 44 percent pure. And you'd say, pure what? Well, I don't know. It was pure. Yeah, and it, remember the phrase? So pure it floats, which was actually an, a process error. Someone whipped the, uh, the soap too long and got air in it, and it, now it floats. But they, they made a whole, whole empire off that. By the way, that's why ivory soap goes away after you use it twice. It just kind of... 
I know, microwaving ivory soap bars is way cool. Okay, I didn't recommend that, but you'll, you, can find it, you can find it on the internet. It's, it's pretty neat. But anyway, 99 and 44, 100, people you know, from the 1870s and now would say, that's pure. I mean, that's, that's great. I, we're done if it's that much, right? That's not good in the Father's eyes? You know what? We are zero percent in Father's sight. That's right. So we have to be totally pure. And it, it's hard to, you know, in, in our grading by a curve kind of culture and thinking, it's hard to get an idea how pure pure is. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go a little nerdy on you for a second. Is that okay? Let me show you this. See this thing up here? Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, you're right, I didn't get it. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let my nerd hang out. That's what I'm going to do right now. Yeah, because I came from the electronics industry. This is a lot of what I studied. That big round log right there is a, is a single crystal of silicon, is what it is. And uh, to make the magical things you carry around in your pocket, the electronics, what they do is they grow a single crystal of, of silicon, which is actually looks like a big log. Some of the logs they make today are 18 inches in diameter. They're gigantic. And, but it's a single crystal. It's, a single, it's, it's made kind of like when you do rock candy like this, you know, and you stick it in the super saturated solution and it makes crystals. It's the same kind of idea. And then they take that silicon crystal and they chop it up into wafers. They slice it into wafers. And then they do something on the surface of the wafer by putting impurities in different places. And when they put impurities in different places, they make transistors. Aren't you glad you came today? <laughs> the purity issue is a big deal here. Because that, that silicon you start with, you're going to add impurities to the surface of it to make transistors. So the, the silicon itself has to be extraordinarily pure in levels that most of us never encounter in day-to-day -day life, ever. So to help you kind of figure this out, if I had a, if I had a train car full of 100% pure silicon, now this is a train car, this is, this is about five to 6,000 cubic feet, it's gigantic, okay? And it was all full of silicon, and I wanted to put just enough impurities into this train car of silicon to start making my transistors, okay? Just a little bit. This deliberate impurity that I introduce has to be the size of a match head. A match head in a train car of silicon. And that makes that train car afterwards deliberately uh, very, it's, it's not pure, but it's deliberately impure. It's deliberately impure to 99.9999999%. And that's, and you can make a transistor out of that. But it's got to be that much. But that says, that the train car, when it rolls into the station with your ultra-pure silicon, has got to be more pure than that, or the transistors will never work. More pure than that. And you get a batch that's even in this range of impure, you just throw it away. It just doesn't work. And you say to yourself, how do you make anything that pure? Well, that's what you go to college to figure out. But this is the standard. The stuff that you have in your pocket for a phone del re deliberately relies on incredibly pure things made Deliberately impure by a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. Tiny bit. Tiny bit. And if you, into this train car of silicon, if you put something of the order of a thousand match heads in there, uh, more like 10,000 maybe, a thousand match heads, you've actually completely spoiled the silicon. Uh, that much impurity. It's so delicate. So delicate. So that's the purity levels that we just never think about. And that, that, is extraordinarily impure to get in heaven. Even that much. And he says, not only abide by all things, but you have to perform them. You can't just say, ah, I really like being good, and then not do it. You actually have to be impeccably perfect once you understand what the law is, every single one of them, which is hard by itself. But then you actually have to do it. You actually have to do it in everything you do. Now, if you're, getting to, yeah, if you're getting to this thinking, well, you mean more pure than that train car? Oh, tons, tons more pure than the train car. Tons more. Tons more. When you get to a funeral, this is what's said many times. But he was such a good person. And that's usually in response to, well, you know, he had his scallywag side. He did a few kind of goofy things, you know. He sowed his wild oats, but, you know, basically... He was such a good person, which is also a way to calm our hearts to say that when this person who died goes to heaven, God's going to say, you were such a good person. That's how we calm our hearts. Unfortunately, the standard 
is stricter than my rail card of silicon. In fact, can I do one more nerdy example? Let's say, let's say that in your entire lifetime, you can every minute choose to sin or obey the law. One of the two, every minute, Every minute of every day, you, every minute you can choose to sin or not sin. And so right now I'm going to do good. A minute later you say I'm going to do good. A minute later. So let's say in an entire lifetime, every minute you can choose to do either do the law or to do sin. And let's just say, hypothetically speaking, that you are so good. He's such a good person. He, you're so good that you actually uh, only choose to sin once. So out of 16 hours a day for 72 years, you're only going to sin in the next minute. And for the rest of your life, you're perfect. Never a sin. Never a fault in the law. Never happens. You don't think so? We could all make a pact and say, I promise never. No, it says, so even at this level of purity, that is failing one minute out of all the minutes of your life, you will still be 250 times more impure than that rail car. 250 times more. One minute of error in an entire lifetime of error. God judges by a standard that <clears throat> is pretty tough. <laughs> in fact, uh, I would dare to say really tough. Well, and then the, you know, the obvious response to this is, well, so what about all the good things? Okay, so I screw up for one minute out of an entire lifetime of minutes. I don't get partial credit for all the good I did? That's, that's you know... <laughs> you might as well shoot yourself, you know. But do you get partial credit? I mean... There's no credit for all the good stuff that you do. This, is, this thought goes through my mind every time a policeman pulls me over. Because I say to myself, this is a one-time deal. What about all the other time I'm good? They never pull me over for all the things I do good. Don't I get credit for all the good that I do? I'm a great driver most of the time, so I screwed up today. But I don't get any credit for the other stuff. I was good. I restrained myself when that guy did that thing. You know what? I, I was... I don't get any credit for that. No, I just get a ticket for the one thing I did wrong today. I, I do this in my head every time while he's walking up to the car. I just think. Do you have many of these? It doesn't, happen. Does, doesn't happen often. Doesn't happen often. But come on, I hear nervous laughter. You think the same thing. Don't I get credit for all the good things I do? Why are you focusing on the one time I do something bad? Well, because the standard is so high. Let me, let me just show you a few things. If you've never read this verse, it'll take all the wind out of your sails. James 2.10. Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, well, you've been guilty of the whole thing. Well, so if I'm really good on everything else, I don't get any partial credit? No, because once you screw up, you're a sinner. And that's the end of that. You're a sinner. One, it only takes one thing to mess up the all perfection kind of thing. And you think that's bad enough. If you read the next verse, James explains it to us enough that it really hurts. He says in the next verse, verse 11, he who said do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit murder, but you do, I mean, do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, then you become a transgressor of the law. See that? So he says, you can spend an entire lifetime doing right on the adultery part of the Ten Commandments, but if you murder once in your lifetime, you're a murderer. It doesn't matter how many times you did everything else right, right? Yeah, okay, I guess that's true. And when a murderer goes to court, they judge him based on the murder, and he goes to jail based on the murder, and an entire lifetime of doing everything else good doesn't count. It's a murder. You're a murderer. Hmm. No partial credit? No credit for the good things I do? Well, just to amp this up right here, so now see James's argument, even if you do perfectly on the adultery thing your entire life, you never do that, but you happen to murder once, darn, you're a murderer. Well, then Jesus ups the ante right here in Matthew 5, and he says, you've heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. Yeah, yeah. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Yeah, okay. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and at the end of the verse, guilty enough to go into fiery hell. <sighs> it's getting worse. So James says, if you do everything right, but you murder once, you're a murderer. And Jesus says, if you're angry with your brother, you're a murderer in your heart. You're guilty, guilty enough for fiery hell. Now it's getting tough. <laughs> and in fact, that, 
the whole context of Matthew 5, that's exactly what Jesus is trying to say. He starts off in Matthew 5 with the Beatitudes. Remember that? You know, blessed are the blessed are the blessed are. That's okay. But very soon after that, he says, you know what? I didn't come here to abolish the law. We've talked about this before. I didn't come here to, to wipe out the rules of what righteousness and loving kindness and justice look like. I didn't come to do that. I came to fulfill it. That's right after the Beatitudes. And then he drops a bomb on his listeners and he says, read this for yourself, I'm not lying to you, Matthew 5. He says, your righteousness has got to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. <laughs> of the Pharisees, the guys who are the perfect do-gooders, the guys who professionally work to do good. He says, if your righteousness and the law is the righteousness. If your righteousness does not exceed these guys right here, you're not making it in the kingdom of heaven, which is a backhanded way of saying, and they're not either. <laughs> they're not getting in. You, they don't have enough. You have to actually go way past them. And to sort of drill in his point as he goes through Matthew 5, he says, let me just illustrate for you for a second. He says what we just read. You've heard it said that murder's bad. Anger is murder that's just not acted out. You've heard that adultery is bad. Well, lust is just adultery that's not acted out. And he goes on down the list of things you're saying, well, you're convicting me for the attitude of my heart, not for my actions. He goes, yeah, exactly. That's how much more your righteousness has to exceed the Pharisees. Your heart's got to get totally clean. In every layer that the law speaks to the nature of your heart, you have got to control your heart perfectly. And in fact, what he does at the end of that passage, I don't know if this is next. Let me see if it is. Um, oh, that's our conclusion. This is impossible. And so at the end of Matthew 5, he says the most famous verse for Mormons. If you're a Mormon, if you have a Mormon background, and you only know a handful of verses out of the Bible, this is the one you know. And Jesus caps off that entire discussion. It starts with, I'm not here to abolish the law. You have to perform better than the Pharisees. You have to control your heart in all things altogether. So you have to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, if you don't get the message, this is getting really hard. You've missed it someplace. And yet, I, I just got to, if, if you're an ex-Mormon or you're watching right now and you're struggling with this, most of the teaching in the Mormon church is that Jesus would not have commanded this if we couldn't do it. That's the rationale. Well, if you read all of chapter 5, he's trying to make the point that this is the standard. You have to be as good as God himself. And everything that precedes it, he's trying to illustrate that you just can't do it. You have to be more righteous than the Pharisees themselves, including taming your own heart. Now, you tell me, can you be that perfect? That's what Jesus is saying at the end. You've got to be as perfect as God. If you want to play this game, if you want to play this game of looking up the law, saying what you do and don't do, and you want to live by doing and not doing what the law says, that's the standard. That's the standard. Perfect. I was depressed when Jesus says that your righteousness has to exceed the Pharisees, because I know I can't do that. And then he drills it further into heart issues, and then he caps it off by saying, oh, by the way, this means you have to be as perfect as God is. Anyone want to sign up for that program? But this is actually part and partial of most false religions. Most false religions will say, you need to do good. You need to do good. You need to control yourself and be good, 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 so that tomorrow you'll be gooder than you were yesterday. And by the end of your life, you'll be the goodest you could possibly be in your entire life. And at that point, God will look at you based on some unknown measuring tape and say, good enough. And we all die wondering whether the measuring tape is going to find us wanting or sufficient. That's false religion. That is totally, that is not biblical religion at all. That's totally false religion. Yeah, true. <laughs> you can pay, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, and, and that's the funny thing. The history of false religions has tried to figure out how to mediate this problem forever. And, and Paul is trying to say in Galatians, don't sign up for this program. He, he, put the, he put the sign in the road and he said, listen, you don't want to do this because you have to do all, capital all which is not 99.9999% pure, it's 100% pure. 100. By the way, you don't hardly find anything in nature that's 100% pure. Everything's kind of smooshed together, but you've got to be 100% pure. Nerd moment one more time. <laughs> I, I worked in NASA for a while in a wind tunnel down Ames. Hey, Glenn. Woo -hoo. Glenn was there. 
um, in a wind tunnel. And one day we had, we had Kirkland uh, Air Force Base, which is the weapons lab for the Air Force down in, uh, I think it's New Mexico or, or Arizona. And they came up to test something. They tested a, a flat sheet. It, wasn't a, it didn't look like a plane. It was a flat sheet that had, had a metal ball that was three quarters submerged into the sheet. And, and on the, in the part of the metal ball that was exposed, it could, it could turn like a turret, basically. And it had this big hole cut out of it. And, and, uh, and it could turn, and the hole could face any direction toward the wind or not. And, and I said, gosh, what is that? And they said, well, we're testing to see whether or not an optical telescope inside the plane can bounce off a mirror and come out the hole, and you can aim the telescope in any direction. And I said, wow, that's cool. Why, why don't you have a glass window on that hole? Because that hole was just sucking up a lot of Mach 2 air. <laughs> why don't you just put a window on that? And there's this long pause from the guy from the weapons lab, and he says, well, you can't get glass good enough for a telescope to look through. Yeah. And my first response is, well, they make, tele- they make telescope lenses out of glass. What are you talking about? So as time went on, it was actually pretty obvious that this was a laser. This was a guided laser weapon is what it was. And they would put a gigantic laser inside the belly of the plane. It would bounce off a mirror inside, come up to the mirror inside this turret, and then go out the open hole, and you could aim it in any direction, so you could shoot things down with this laser. And so finally I confronted this captain from the Air Force. I said, this is a laser weapon, isn't it? You know, come on. And he said, well, I can't say yes or no, but that's a very good insight. And I said, can't you still put glass in front of this hole that's sucking all the air when you aim it up in the airstream? He says, well, actually, no, because this laser is so powerful that even, even the slightest amount of impurity in that glass would soak up the heat of the laser and the glass would just blow up into a billion pieces. And I said, well, how much impurity? He says, we haven't been able to make glass ever that's that pure. Now, this is what we're talking right here. You know, the laser, the laser intensity of God's judgment is such that no matter how much you clean up the glass in your life, you're not going to survive it. And that's why Paul says, everyone who goes on this path and tries to make themselves pure by doing all the law are doomed. You just can't do it. You can't do it. By the way, that laser weapon is flying today, I'm happy to say. Okay, anyway. I don't know if it makes me happy. I feel safer at night. Here's another place where Jesus says it's impossible. He told, he told a story. You go back and you find the context, because I think you'll find it fascinating. But look at the response from the, from the disciples. They were even more astonished and said to him, well, who can be saved? Isn't that the reaction you're having today? <laughs> well, then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said, with people, it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. <sighs> finally, good news. And in fact, that is the good news. That is exactly the good news right there. Jesus was telling, you go look this up. You tell me what, come back next week and tell me what the passage was. What is it that, that Jesus said to them that they, said, they threw their hands up in the air and said, well, then who can be saved? Come on, who can be saved? So Jesus was in the, he was in the business of trying to give people the idea that if you try and work to make yourself good, you're doomed. But there is an answer. There is an answer. With people, yes, it is usually doable. No, with people it's impossible. But with God, it's possible. And this, this was his mission. That was the mission of John the Baptist, to give people a clue that they, that they were in deep doo-doo, that, that they were doomed. And this is the central message of the entire Bible, in fact, that mankind, starting with the fall and compounded by our own propensity for doing sin, are doomed. And no matter how much you buff up the glass in your life, the laser will still make you explode. You're doomed. That's the bad news. And the good news is God's got a way figured out for you. So that, that's the simplistic way of looking at it. So he goes on, <clears throat> and he uses a few more Old Testament passages to make his point. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. Remember, justified means to be made right with the king. This is to be made right with God. Now that no one is made right with God by the law, it's evident. For Look at this passage. The righteous man shall live by faith. This is the verse I quoted last week, and I couldn't remember. The, it was Habakkuk 2.4. That verse changed Paul's life. Boom. Boom. The righteous live by faith. And not by effort. By faith. And then he brings up another verse. However, verse 12. The law is not of faith. On the contrary, 
He who practices them shall live by them, from Leviticus 18.5. So if you want to live your life practicing the law, thinking you're going to make yourself better, you really got to do that. And it's a, it's a day-to-day burdensome effort. It has nothing to do about faith at all. It's all sheer willpower. Not going to get anywhere. And then, my point is, so what's the solution? Is there a solution? And this is where he switches in Galatians 3 and says, yes, there is a solution. Because remember he said back in Mark 10, with people it's impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. So here's the dilemma. The law states a level of righteousness, and Jesus extends that to the nature of our hearts, and we stand back and say, can't do it. And yet, Jesus says in the beginning of Matthew 5, but I didn't come to take the law away, to eradicate the law. The law still stands. It still stands there, and you're doomed. (sighs) But I didn't come to take the law away. I came to fulfill it, which means that he was the only one who could actually live the law perfectly. Top to bottom, he was, he was righteousness, as Jer- Jeremiah 9 says, he was loving kindness and justice, and what's the last one, and loving kindness, justice, and I forgot the last one, look it up, but I'm all those things in the, in the flesh that God delights in on earth. He's the only guy who could do that. So what's the solution? And that's where Paul segues, 13, Christ redeemed us, which means he purchased us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That's from the Old Testament. So the problem is the law has condemned us. We're doomed. And the law is not going away. Jesus says, uh, 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 not one jot or tittle. It's all going to stay. It stays there and it condemns you. So our problem is the curse, is the doom that's there. And what Jesus did was he took the doom, the curse, and took it on himself so that he is cursed on our behalf. So the idea is not to try and achieve righteousness by doing the law. It's really to despair and see I can't do it and say, but Christ, the only one who actually embodied the law, who actually lived that kind of righteousness, came and died on my behalf so that my debt, my curse, can be placed on him instead, and he'll die in my place. So if you've ever heard all the whole thing about Christ died in my place, it's because of the curse of the law. No one can live that righteous. But Christ did, and he took the law. In in Isaiah 53, it says that all our iniquity was placed on him. Iniquity is failing to do the law. All of our iniquity was placed on him, and as a result of what he did on our behalf, we can find life. He was wounded for, for what we did. He was afflicted for what we did. So the entire Bible is saying this very consistently from Genesis all the way up through Revelation, is that you will never measure up. You just never will measure up for God's status of righteousness. And if you ever want to have fellowship with God, you have to be in that camp somehow, but you can't do it. Who is going to save me from this body of sin, Paul says? Christ does. If, if we place our faith in him and trust in his payment on our behalf. That's, that's key. And he goes on and says, in verse 14, in order that in the Messiah, that's the Jewish term for the king, the anointed king, in order that in the Messiah Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Now right there he says what most Jews would say is absolutely blasphemous. The, the promise to Abraham, they thought, came to Abraham's offspring, the Jews, and the Jews alone. And now Paul's saying, This promise and blessing of Abraham has now been extended to the Gentiles. The deliberate sinners. The clueless, deliberate sinners of the world. It's been extended to them, that it might come to them. Wow, through faith in this Christ who died for us. And then he finishes, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through works. Oh, did I read that wrong? I'm sorry. Promise of the Spirit through faith. Through faith, we put our faith and trust in the only one who has ever achieved the law, Christ himself. The only one who lives as the perfect embodiment of the righteousness of God on earth. And we put our trust in him, and we simultaneously say, because I can't do it. But God has provided a way. Bad news, you're doomed. Good news, he took the doom, and now we can live. It's really that simple. Bad news, good news. Really, that's the whole thing. And in doing so, he has made us right with the king. 
so that in the end we can live with God and not be pushed away because we're too dirty and not be pushed away because we didn't buff up our glass enough that the incredible intensity of his righteous judgment blows us up because in Christ we're saved. And that's, that's just the whole thing. So you don't go back to violating that. Oh, okay. We're going to stop there today because that's too much. <laughs> okay. Um, but, ah, oh, man. Just one more thing. And this is a very natural question. Then why did God give the law at all? I mean, if we're not supposed to obey it, at least to achieve our own righteousness, then why is it there at all? I mean, it's just kind of a pain, don't you think? It just... It's, well, that's going to be next week. So we're going to talk about that. And this is where Paul segues in Galatians. You know, he, He's saying, if the law is not meant to be a handbook to be good so I can earn God's favor, then why is the handbook there? All right? And it's a really, really good question. It's an outstanding question. And Paul knows that that's what his readers are thinking as they're reading through Galatians. So next week he's going to switch over and show why the law is necessary and why the law is good and why it is in Jeremiah 9.23, God says, I delight in it. And the writer of Psalm, Psalm 119 says, it's my delight. It's, it's, it tastes better than honey to me. And I love it with my whole being. Do you mean this? Handbook that we can't do? What? what? And most, most Christians don't really get the idea. Most Christians use a very simplistic view and say, faith, good. Law, bad. That's too simplistic. Not if the psalmist says, I love the law. And not if Jesus says, it's not going to be eradicated. I'm going to fulfill it. So there's something remarkably good about it. But yet... Where do we put it in our lives? And that's the real question. Where do we put it in our lives if it's not meant to be the list to do tomorrow? <laughs> I need understanding. So we're going to look at that next week. <coughs> ah, go away. We're not going to do that today. You can read ahead if you'd like to. I never stop you from doing that, but it's a, it's a marvelous place where Paul has taken us through these first two and a half chapters down to this point that we can't do anything with the law. So don't try and reincorporate it in your life. You know, look, at the, look at the sign on the road. Don't do this. You know, you're doomed if you do this. You're actually doomed if you go back to trying to live the law to impress God. You're doomed. You didn't start your walk with Christ that way, so why are you incorporating it in your life right now? That's all he's saying. So let's get back to the idea of how the law actually works in our life in a valuable way that over time we come to love it. And in fact, one last, one last point. You can, you can really tell the difference between people who are real followers of Christ and people who aren't really following Christ. Because when you talk about the requirements of the law, one will see it as a tremendous burden, and the other one will see it with great delight. Now, if you're using that on yourself right now, you're thinking, uh-oh. <laughs> I'm kind of uh, somewhere over here, I think, uh, maybe. Uh. We're going to try and push you over to this end because it, it really is a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. And it's at the core of Jesus' most provocative statement in the entire New Testament. He said, come to me, all you guys who are, who are wearied and you're burdened, and I'll give you rest. Because my yoke, if that's the real burden, my yoke is a light one. And most people said, say what? <laughs> and it all comes back to the law. It all comes back to the law. Okay, let's quit. Father, we thank you for your great and marvelous word to us. Your words are not our words. Your ways are not our ways. Your thoughts aren't your, our thoughts. They are so high and above and beyond us. And yet, just like the rain, you send your words down to us. And just like the rain, it accomplishes exactly what you sent it to do to nourish. And so we thank you for your word today. And Lord, we, we struggle with the whole idea of being do-gooders and how much that's required of us or not required of us. or It sounds out of control if we say we disregard the, word, the, the law, but, uh, we, but we want to know exactly your intention in it. We want to know your heart in it. We want to know why Jeremiah can say that you delight in it. We want to know why the psalmist can say, it's, it's, I love it with all my heart, and it's like it's sweeter than honey. And Lord, for most of us, we, we don't get that. 
We don't get that. But we do get this. And Lord, we, we pray with thankfulness right now. We do get that because of Christ, the curse and the doom has passed by us. It's passed over us. And now as we stand in our trust in Christ, we can stand with you. And in that, the promise of Abraham comes to us, a life living in the presence of God himself. And Lord, we get that part. So we thank you for your great loving kindness to us and your mercy that you show to us and your loving kindness that accommodates our sin. So thank you for all this now. Continue to draw us close to you as we read through Galatians and continue to allow us to celebrate and exalt in this God who would come on our behalf and die for us so that he might take the curse for us. Who does that? But in your immense love you have for us. So thank you for this. We're amazed at your love for us. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.